They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. We don't need to go populist left or populist right. We don't need to embrace neo-Marxism or neo-fascism, these disastrous movements from the 20th century. Turns out the answer is pretty much our Bill of Rights. Our story. Embrace freedom. That's the answer. And if the LP has a purpose, it's not to put people to sleep. It's to wake them up. We're here because we love liberty. And we're here because we hate injustice. We are here to save mankind. We are here to fight. Join us, the Libertarian Party, in perhaps the most exciting, grandest endeavor in history, the restoration of American liberty. Ideas spread, they can't stop them. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome to episode 64 of Decentralized Revolution, a podcast from the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and Mises PAC. I'm Aaron Harris and I'm your host. Uh, My guests today are, for the time being, uh, they're choosing to remain anonymous. They're they're both professionals in the world of film and television, and they decided, uh, along with some colleagues a few months ago, that they really had to tell some of the very important stories about all this virus stuff and the government's uh, reaction to it, that the corporate media, of course, and uh, big tech, they're working so hard to suppress uh, these stories. And they thought, hey, you know, if no one else is going to tell these stories, we're going to have to to try to do that. But uh, because of that climate and uh, the climate that exists not only everywhere, but in Hollywood uh, in particular, um, they're waiting for the right moment to decide when and, and whether they're going to put their names out there. Um, and that's why there's no video for this episode. They ask that we do audio only, which of course I'm happy to accommodate. Uh, it, it's amazing that we have to, to think this way, uh, in America these days, but we do, um, for, for the time being, they are hard at work on a project called follow the science on lockdowns and Liberty. And uh, it started out as a documentary feature length film, but uh, quickly, I think, sort of uh, uh, expanded in their minds to become a a multi episode docu series. Uh, They're raising money to help them keep going and complete this project. And uh, over on the show notes page at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 64, uh, you'll be able to find the link to go help them out. Uh, this is uh, really going to be a quality project from what I've seen and heard. Uh, it's very much on the level of the unseen, which of course is the 30 minute documentary, uh, produced by some of our people out with the California Mises caucus about the effect the lockdowns have had on small business people out there. Uh, and this project is, seems like it's going to be that, uh, uh, but expanded to cover several other aspects Uh, of this whole mess. And so I'm really proud to have them on. I think you'll be excited to hear what they have to say and what their plans are. So here's my talk with uh, two of the men behind Follow the Science on Lockdowns and Liberty. Welcome to Decentralized Revolution. Thanks. Well, yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Aaron. Glad to be here. Thanks. It's great to have you both. Hawk and John are the, the, the names you're going by. And as I was thinking about recording this, and uh, as, as uh, uh, the listeners know by now that we're not doing a video version of this, uh, the older I get, the more I think about kind of the America that I grew up in. And I remember the late 70s and early 80s and into the 90s and what type of a world that was. And if you would have told me that somebody was making a film documentary and they didn't want their identities out there at at a certain point, I would have assumed they were like communists or Klansmen, or they had, you know, evidence on, on who killed Kennedy or like, I I would have thought it was, would be something that radical, but yet here we are in 2021. So just explain what, um, what led you to do this project and why from the beginning, uh, you have been careful as to um, allow only certain people to know who's doing what. 
Well, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll get, give a brief uh, background on sort of the SoundMind Creative Group, and then and John was sort of implemental in terms of how this thing all got started. But uh, you know, we, everyone in, who's part of our of SoundMind CG is a uh, a professional filmmaker who's worked in the business for 15, 20, 25 years plus. We have a lot of a lot of a robust background um, in in terms of years of experience across all the members of the group. And as such, we've all been there and understood that, I mean, the cancel culture is something we would sort of see like that. We would say that that's the new awareness and reality once the sort of Internet came along and, and, and social media and the YouTube phenomena, people became aware of cancel culture. But we were used to groupthink within the Hollywood film structure for the entirety of our career. We learned quickly that you had to hold to a certain way of, of thinking and speaking if you wanted to work, if you let yourself go just even with just being like a serial you know young when you're in your 20s serial contrarian exploring ideas wanting to have debate even that you would realize that your phone would ring less you would get uh, you would get dressed down on set and you would be it'd be made very apparent that you were somehow out of bounds and i i mean i in my 20s i wasn't even overtly political i've always had a strong uh, bent on freedom of expression and a desire to protect it um but i but it, it, it was very apparent that you had to keep your mouth shut if you wanted to work. And uh, and so then this, you know, fast forward and we're in this new era where there's a you know nationwide idea of cancel culture. And I mean, and also Hollywood always kept things really buttoned up where you didn't really, you, know, you, you didn't share what you worked on. You kept it confidential and all that. So we wanted to sort of create that for ourselves and those who are working with us so we could sort of reemphasize privacy and have openness behind our efforts to get this project off the ground. And it all got started with a phone call by John. And I'll, I'll toss it over to you, John. Yeah, well, this the the whole idea for this started back in, uh, I guess, probably March of um, of this year. Uh, and it and it was due to a, a Tom Woods podcast. He had a uh, a gentleman on uh, named Ian Miller who uh, does amazing charts that that essentially show that all of these measures, uh, lockdowns and mask mandates, have no impact, if not um, negative impact, on on outcomes for COVID. Um, and and Tom said, you know, I just wish somebody would make a high quality documentary about this stuff, show the data, show the stories of people whose lives have been decimated by these policies and uh, show the politicians talking confidently about how if we do this, it's going to solve the problem. Um, and I, I looked in the, I, 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 my first response was, I, gosh, I'd really like to see that documentary. And then I looked in the mirror and I was like, well, why, why shouldn't I be doing that? And so I got on the phone with, uh, with my partners and, and we, we weren't necessarily partners at that point we've collaborated before on other projects but i said to these guys what do you think about this and you know i didn't know how serious i was about it it's a, a big and serious undertaking um but the more we talked about it the more we felt like it was a critical story that needed to be told and if and if we didn't stand up and do it uh who knows when and how it would it would get done so um we we committed to it and it's evolved over over the last six months. Initially, it was going to be a documentary, and now we've decided that it needs to be a docu series. So we're looking at uh, probably five hours of content when all is said and done. Um, so yeah, that's uh, how it came to be. Just real quickly, I want to address uh, uh, something before we get into the uh, the film. And I'm fascinated. I worked on a documentary once, and I know how difficult it is. But what's your what's the um, end game as far as distribution? I mean, obviously Netflix is not going to uh, pick this up because if they did, you know, Barack Obama would would call and say, you know. So how do you hope to get this out to people in this climate where YouTube is just you know, slashing people who are, you know, talking about, you know, natural immunity and stuff like that. What's what's the plan? Yeah, I mean, it's getting rougher and rougher out there. I mean, our initial plan is really, you know, we 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 want to bring a production level, a quality level, and a and a uh, a balanced enough project that we feel it could break through and on a Netflix uh, style uh, streaming service. 
Um, we understand that uh, politically the climate's getting even worse and worse. Uh, we, we have sort of plans. We have uh, various promoters that we're, we're speaking with. Our, 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 the way we thought about it was like, it's a lot easier to sell something once it's done. And so we've, we're really focused on that because, I mean, everyone everyone's peddling something like, oh, we're going to do this great idea. And we're like, you know, this is this is so important. We're going to get it done. And then we'll, we'll, we'll shoot as high as we can. We all have contacts with the industry. industry. We'll push it. We'll pitch it and uh, and screen it and, uh, you know, get as high a level as we can. And if for any reason that that's a no go because the the the. The climate gets that much more divisive and, and shut down, and distribution really is a stranglehold on anything that, that would counter narrative. We'll push as hard as we can the indie side of things and and help uh, you know help help the new uh, platforms you know maybe we'll be exclusively release there. But uh, you know we're by hook or by crook we're going to get this thing out as far as and far as far and um, as we can. That, that's great, and I I, uh, I hope you you know that I meant that. Um, I think from what little I've seen and what I know about this project, I know it's going to be really good and, and better than, you know, 90% of the other stuff that you do see on things like Netflix and stuff. But I just assume the better it is, the less likely um, <laughs> it, it, will, it will get because then they'll be afraid people will watch it. But we can, we can leave that sure. for yeah, uh, that's, that's, another time because that's a whole rabbit hole, but absolutely. Yeah. It, we're, it we're, but we're with, and that's the thing. I mean, there's so there's. I mean, we're in the golden era of documentaries, but it's also this odd time where it's it's starting to kind of morph into this propaganda world where you have all these documentaries. I mean, regardless of the issue, if it's something you're for or against, where they just kind of hit one note and are selling one thing, and we just we're just curious storytellers who want to understand what happened, and we want to and we want to talk to the experts and learn from it and have a conversation. And and I feel if we maintain that approach we have a good chance of getting proper distribution. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. You mentioned golden age of documentaries. Um, what are some of the ones that uh, that you guys like from the past, you know, five, 10 years? And, and it, you don't have to name these, but like, you know, you mentioned ones that just kind of hit one note, have an agenda, aren't really telling the story. Uh, to give people an idea what your aesthetic is, maybe talk about, you know, examples of each. John, you want to take that one? I guess. I'm going to ply my memory here. <laughs> um, well, I, there, there are certainly ones that have stood out for me um, in terms of tone. I mean, it, it's not so much content. I, I've rarely seen a kind of politically oriented documentary that, is, that has impacted me. Um, but I think of things like uh, Hero Dreams of Sushi and My Octopus Teacher, um, the series Wild Wild Country, um, those aesthetically I, I find really fascinating uh, because they're, they're, um, they're stories. It's not just conveying information. It, 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 it's, a, it's a narrative story um, embedded in information and, and, and the, the total package impacts you on a, on a really profound emotional level. And I, you know, we have a challenge in that. Obviously, our our focus is going to be interview based, um, but but I think we all have the goal for it not just to be people sitting there, uh, you know, moving their mouths, but something that's got got more heart to it and and more uh, kind of artistic merit. Yeah. Hawk, what about? Uh, um, did you come up with anything? Well, I mean, it's, it's it's always tough. I I I don't consume much. I'll be honest with you. I uh, I I've I've learned that the the world of film is so so powerful, and and so many of the documentaries in the last few years have such a, a, a slant and such an agenda or pieces of propaganda. I always find it so irritating that I I tend not to watch too much. Um, except for I love like. The blue planet and and this sort of new the, the world of hd drone stuff where suddenly you could get into all these worlds and you can see the, the way the world works in the way you haven't before um i mean i you go back to i i do think a lot about the documentaries such as inconvenient truth and um fahrenheit 9 11 and or um uh yeah and uh you know, the, the Michael Moore stuff and all, all of those documentaries. I remember watching those coming through the pipeline. And and that was the early days of having a documentary that completely shifted 
the conversation with everyone around me. I was in LA, right? So I was, I, and I, I actually remember when I went to Human Convenient Truth, I actually paid for flight 93. I was like, I told my friends, <laughs> I'll go, but I don't want to pay for it because I know it's just going to be one giant, one giant slanted thing. Um, and because uh, I, because I always, I, I just always have had a healthy uh, BS detector, shall we say. And, um, but, but I remember watching the way those were presented and the way suddenly it wasn't just, the lay person who was talking about that and that became the ground uh understanding of of the issue it b became all the news media the politicians everyone would re reference that those documentaries as like well have you seen this don't you i mean it's it's kind of like how talking heads refer to books i mean if you've read this book by such and such an author then you should be you've done the required reading it's become the re re required viewing and i really see those films as the ones that really um uh kind of set a new tone in terms of the importance of documentaries. So, you know, I, and I, and, and as well as the need for documentaries that looked at, uh, looked at topics in a more neutral way or a fair way, or weren't necessarily coming, coming with a specific agenda. So that's part of the reason I, I made the jump to documentaries from the narrative side um, back in the day. Yeah, I was actually, before you mentioned an inconvenient truth, I was just thinking of that one. And I too, I, I remember watching it. Uh, I went to see it but only once I, I got someone to agree to pay me to do a review so I could justify yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like minded at the time. Right? In, in my mind, I, I felt like I was going into uh, Times Square Triple uh, yeah. X theater. But I, I even had two signs. I was, I was with my then girlfriend. I had two signs. I had one that said BS and I had one that said misleading. So I could just hold it up to her. So that <laughs> way I didn't care into her. I could just sort of like, because I just, because I, I under, it's, it's amazing how when you create, it, Especially in those days, people it was like half truths, the sin of omission. I just the, the the what's left out is just speaks volumes about where people are coming from, and that's what we want to do the opposite of. We want to try and be as inclusive as possible and really look at all the different uh, variables that came came into play with with what we're going through with lockdowns. And, and one of the reasons I was thinking about inconvenient truth was the famous. Uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, uh, it started from looking at the the Tom Woods uh, uh, charts. They forgot, you know. Um, uh, yeah, right. Tom, Tom didn't do them, but uh, we'll have a link Ian, to the Ian, guy who yeah, did. Yeah, the what's the Twitter handle? Ian something. Okay, well, um, well, I'll put it on the show notes page. Sure. Um, uh, but uh, Al Gore, you know, the Inconvenient Truth had the famous you know hockey stick uh, yep. graphic, uh, and I, that shows just kind of how powerful that you know because they become these sort of touchstones that. You know, it's very it's a very easy in someone's mind to uh, uh, remember people remember from that film, the uh, the hockey stick and the polar bears. And uh, mm -hmm. that, that's what people remember. And they still cite that as well. I watched that. So I know, that, you know, the, the question is settled. We've got an issue here with COVID that's um, it's not quite as big. Uh, but actually kind of almost has gotten that big. And I think for the same reasons, it's the first um, true global experience. Everyone you know, <laughs> everyone you've ever been, is also dealing with it. Yeah, at the same time, yeah. Yeah. So how how did you think, um, going from the idea of looking at these charts and, and the powerful message they send, um, how do you start getting your arms around this as a as a filmmaker, do you kind of storyboard it? Do you think of how, how we're going to do this visually first? Or do you think about the, 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 the linear narrative of it? Or how does that work? Well, we have a we, we created a treatment. I mean, we're we're still very much in the fundraising phase. We have another month of, of hardcore fundraising going on. We, we came up with our, our, our basic concept. Uh, and 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 we're, we're going at we kind of have a two phase thing. We're going after a pilot. We're fundraising for our sort of our, our uh, development costs and 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 pilots. So we, we 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 sort of focused on that. So we have a main project, but we're 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 sort of seeing the pilot as the first part, and we want to get that done. We have, we're calling it the proof of concept pilot. Basically, we're taking out coming out with an initial thirty minute piece to show what it's going to be, what's going to be about, and then we're going to pursue the rest of the financing after that because people respond to doers and to when they see product and that kind of thing. So that's part of our strategy. Um, but part of the strategy, too, is, I mean, right now there's the big hot potato 
with what's going on with the jab, shall we say. And, and, and the, I mean, it's getting more and more divisive. I mean, as you, I think you already referenced YouTube is now, you know, that anyone speaking against anything that has anything to do with a jab, regardless of the disease is getting yanked. And that's the current hot potato. And that's what the, the news cycle is all about. And, but every week there's some hot new hot potato that that is designed to keep our frontal lobes occupied and everyone's talking about it and reacting to it and there's never we haven't had a moment to really look back and and look at well what happened before i mean there was a moment in which respirators were i mean were the thing that we had to worry about it was it was like a sci-fi you know weekly problem of like oh god we're almost out of water oh we're almost out of dilithium crystals you know i mean we're, there's, there's there's been a constant barrage of of issues and we want to go back and look at what was going on right before in terms of the, the science of lockdowns. I mean, as far as, as we've been learning, I mean, there was a lot of discussion going on about lockdowns, but the prevailing policies and the prevailing science was that lockdowns uh, uh, in terms of quarantining the healthy was the known thing not to do. It was targeted protection of the vulnerable. That was the, that was that's where the science was. That's where the policies stood. And there was a shift and we want to get we want to start there. We want to start what happened there. And then we want to understand, you know, when things broke, broke loose and suddenly there was like this flat in the curve and there seemed to be this two week world in which suddenly all the world's governments fell into line. The details are a little different for each culture, but then then they all like, OK, we have to lock down because we have to flatten the curve. You know, and, and, and there was this and, and, and within that, there was sort of like the systematic reduction of, of trade offs and risk assessment. And suddenly we we're no longer and, 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 and the poo pooing of our of our uh, of our we are all complex systems in the form of our immune systems. And there was a sort of systematic aspect. So our, so for the pilot, we really want to focus on on what the lockdowns were, why they're implemented, how they were, what an ideal situation, what, what's an ideal look, lockdown, what it could have looked like, what it, what it ended up looking like, and how the information was released to us versus what was the information actually known on the ground at the time. Um, we wanna focus on that first. So we're gonna start there, and that's why we did, that, the game we went with the docu-series. So that way we can then establish a sort of cultural understanding of, of what happened and build from there and sort of try and try and build a new conversation about what happened as opposed to everyone's sort of recollections, you know, tainted with fear. So how do you show that on screen and uh, an epidemiological uh, uh, practice belief uh, at one date and then at another date, how, how do you how do you put that? Well, we, uh, we, we have a great animation team. We're, well, we're, we're looking at animation in, in one form. We want to like we mentioned the graphs. We want to look at the data. We want to try and bring the data into a a 3D realm of, of where you can actually kind of understand it, not just uh, have an expert explaining it to you, but, but have the numbers take some life. So we're, we're working with an animation team to develop that. Um, you know, of course, we have we have the uh, the, 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 the very scientists that we're, we're and doctors and, and authors that we've been speaking with to uh, um, kind of get get that main story. We're, we also need to bring in, of course, the human interest stories. I mean, there is a great uh, movie you featured uh, previously, The Unseen, looking at the, the human tr uh, the, the problem, the, the real uh, human costs at the, at the business level and personal level and health level. And we want to we want to bring those in to kind of ground it in terms of the real world experience, the human experience. And uh, so we want to train. Basically, we're going to look at three different realms. We want to have the, sort of the scientific realm. We want to have the human interest realm realm. And then we want to have sort of the narrative political realm and triangulate from there. Try and try and have because those are three different perspectives, different jargons, different understandings, different discrete under um, uh, stories will come from each. And we want to use those to triangulate an understanding for our audience. One of the things I've been interested um, in through this whole thing was just the the notion of you know what science is and this whole thing of the science is settled and 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 i'm not a, a science guy like i'm i'm uh, uh, english and history and journalism and all that so I, I i'm not an expert in this field but when they started saying that about global warming i'm like well wait a minute like you're telling me that like every single scientist who knows something about this believes exactly the the, the same thing and and we know there are dissidents to that, and we know how uh, tough it is for them to get their viewpoint out there and how they're dismissed. But like, how does it, I, I guess, how, do you, how did you find people who had a different viewpoint 
did did some of them have you know did some people say no i don't want to be in this because of my career like in other words what what was the reaction um about this weird phenomenon of follow the science the science is settled uh, on this stuff from the science people that you talk to well we're, we're we're building our 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 catalog of such folks i mean we've been um we've had some people say like, well, I'm not sure if I'm a good fit for this because I have these views and that views. And we're like, well, we want to understand those views. We want to have that presentation. I mean, I think there's uh for, for the, tr those who are true to the scientific method and true to their curiosity about the world and true to a, a sort of like their specialty, they, they, it's hard to deny. I mean, everyone kind of agrees there's something fishy going on. You know, there's, there's just, it, it's that sort of un, uh, nameable thing right now where everyone's like, what is going on? There's something that doesn't compute. And I find that there are those, I mean, we, we had a nice interview. Uh, we have a great interview in the can with uh, Naomi Wolf said, just in terms of she's, she's an activist. She's, I mean, she, she was important in the Clinton campaign. She was instrumental in the Gore campaign. I mean, she's, she, she is a, uh, you know, true blue to her, to her political convictions, but she's also, a, but she's, but she's a brilliant woman who has critical thinking. And she's like, there's something wrong here. And there's something that even though it's emanating from my side of the political spectrum, I have to call my, her, her BS detector went off and she's speaking and she's speaking about it. And I think she's very, you know, that, that's the, that's the type of true, truly centered person that we're, we're focusing on um, and it re represents people from a more broad political spectrum. And, and on the scientific side, I mean, there's a lot of science that has, you know, where the specialists know that their science is being corralled into a space that isn't necessarily scientifically sound. Um, and, uh, um, and they, and they, and they, you know, sort of the, the tacit admission, you know, maybe the unsaid admission is like, well, they're all just terrified to lose their money source. I mean, the follow the science is follow the money, really, in certain ways. I mean, there's, it has lots of other meanings. I mean, it has, the, I mean, follow the science is you make, you know, the money is coming from the, 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 the government sector in the form of grants. And if you, if you don't want that to dry up, then do what you're told is sort of the, 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 the fairly obvious meaning behind it. And it's, it's almost like a decree to fall in line. And there's more and more, as more and more scientists of varying political stripes, like, yeah, I mean, I'm true to my science and they're more willing to speak about it. So we're developing those relationships and getting those interviews in the can. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning too, in that regard that the problems of science have really come to the forefront in, in this COVID fiasco but th they are decades long in the making. Um, one one uh, resource that we've drawn heavily on in terms of our thinking about all of this is Brett uh, Wein Weinstein uh, and his wife, Heather Haying, and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing both of their names correctly. Um, and, and they talk a lot about the the structures in academia and in the scientific world that prevent um, a, a real pursuit of the truth as opposed to a, a filtered pursuit. And, and I, I think that uh, science as it's been practiced in America for, for many years uh, has been incentivized incorrectly. And, and so, you know, there, it just raises the question of what, what studies are getting done. You can say, like, I, for example, around, around the issue of ivermectin, you can say, well, no, no double blind study has been done about this. Well, who had the incentive to do a study on this? So just saying no study has been done doesn't mean that this given drug is not effective or that this given drug is, is, uh, is really problematic. Um, those studies haven't been done because they're, 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 the incentive structures are, are not in place to get them done. Um, so it, that's a piece of what we're, we're planning on looking at. Um, as we're drawing kind of broader level conclusions is how has the approach to science been been corrupted and how is that then reverberated throughout the media and how how the media uh, kind of um, magnifies those those quote conclusions um, that that get codified as as settled science. Well, one one uh, way they've done that is by sort of uh, deifying Fauci. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that he's uh, literally this, uh, um, you know, 
almost uh, messianic type figure. And he's like supposedly brilliant and uh, he's a man of integrity. Just look at him. And, you know, from the very beginning, I thought that was kind of weird. And what, you know, every, every good movie needs a villain. Um, and uh, uh, in my mind, Fauci is certainly that. Uh, but uh, what are you finding out ab about uh, about him in, in relation to what John was just talking about? Well, I mean, he is one of the longest served bureaucrat in the federal government. And he has been the at the top of that ladder for so long. And... I mean, he's he's sort of on a. I mean, and he boy, he there's not a camera he doesn't like, or at least a, a friendly camera he doesn't like sitting down in front of. And I've been sort of looking, you know, I, I've been wanting to look at. I, I know there's like some documentary that came out with him that nobody's seen these days, where it's like his attempt to look at his his role in the AIDS epidemic. And you know, I've been doing a little light research there, and, and I mean, he. It's interesting how Fauci is just like, well, I did. He, it's it's. He always talks about like, well, what I did was I listened to the activists. I listened to the activists and oh, everything went great. But if you look at what happened, he, he was the one who did not listen to the activists for two or three, four years and insisted that only one drug, only one pharmaceutical was the only thing that was going to work for, for the AIDS epidemic. And meanwhile, tens of thousands of, of members of the gay community are dying. And but but the people on the ground are like, hey, look, I mean, we, if, if you take these other drugs and mix them and create the cocktail, the now famous cocktail, um, that, that there's there's real success there. And he was actually the one who was resistant and had the power to stop it. And now part of his you know, he seems to be in, in, in like he's on this tour PR tour of trying to basically say if it wasn't for me and listening, that would have never happened when, you know, he it's. Everything he says seems to be uh, the you know, sort of forked tongue kind of aspect to it. I mean, he really does have this, this the ultimate bedside manner where he never says he says everything with just enough wiggle room to get out of it. And I just I, I, his time has passed. The man the man is not a scientist. The man is a bureaucrat through and through. And uh, and he's he, he's it's some sort of megalomania that we're dealing with. And I don't I don't think he has the, be the country's uh, best interest. He's you know, the way he d dismisses it's like it's not a uh, personal liberties issue or uh, it's, it's a, uh, a public health issue. It's a yes. And it's not a it's not a, he's denying the existence of personal liberties. It's like, no, it's both. I mean, we need to figure this out. But he wants to literally deny everyone. The, the ability to talk about personal liberties and personal freedoms and it's just it's it's shocking it's shocking to me i uh I, he's he's an infuriating character and he certainly will play a role as a as a, a villainous role in our in our documentary because he's playing the villainous role in what's going on I, I think it's time to move on from him and yet the scientists to bring it back to what we're talking about the scientists know that if you displease him there are millions of dollars of grants dry up and their their livelihood goes away and so they are all silent and that sin of omission kind of shows its head in that, in that form there yeah go ahead john yeah I, I think it's also important to recognize you, you know you you said it was kind of mysterious how he got got this role this uh, sanctified role and I, and i think a piece of that is that there are very few political leaders through this crisis that have come forward uh, in any way that has been useful and helpful to at least the American public. Uh, a, a point that Naomi Wolf made is that in times of crisis and in times of um, medical crisis in, in history, true leaders come forward to comfort people, to calm them, to help them figure out what is the the rational course of action. And our political leaders, almost to a fault, have been uh, fear-mongering. And, and so Fauci, it, at least, said, if we do these things, we're going to find our way through this pandemic. He, he was advocating things that were really detrimental, but he was at least giving answers. And, and I think that's part of the reason um, people across the political spectrum glommed on to his his perspective. Um, and especially on the left, he was a foil to Trump. 
So I think he became a saint for the left because he was saying something counter to what Trump was saying. And that may well be part of why we are where we are, why people so willingly gave up their rights, um, because half of the country despised Trump. And, and anything that somebody said counter to Trump became gospel to, to that group of people. Yeah, um, I, I was just so thinking about, oh, go ahead, sorry to interrupt. Well, just, just to, to put a button on that, a, a, part of, a part of our goal with the documentary is to reach um, people largely in the uh, left of center crowd uh, that have been misled, who have been taken down a path um, and this is true on a broader level. You know, you can talk about critical race theory or wokeness, all, all of these realms where where people that are moderate but left of center have been kind of pulled in a direction that they probably don't want to go in but feel they have to be. And so um, we're, we're aiming to um, appeal to that crowd and help lead them out of this quagmire that they've that they've uh, kind of gotten themselves into or that they've been led into. Yeah, I was just thinking today, um, uh, I think it was Dave Smith mentioned that uh, Kamala Harris had said uh, when Trump was still president that, hey, she's I'm nervous about this vaccine. I'm not sure about it. And, and now, of course, you know, look where we are. And I was just thinking, you know, what if it were you know, what if Mitt Romney were president during this or, or Obama or Biden or something, the, the different ways this could have uh, played out. But I think it did sort of, I, 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 I'm, I'm a, I, I admit I'm a conspiracy guy and I, I just, the timing of it seems pretty advantageous to me to have it happen in an election year. And uh, I, I'm not a Trump guy at all. I, I think he's an idiot, but like it's it just, the whole thing really fell together uh, rather nicely and then set them up for what they have now, which is where they can, you mentioned that in, in, instead of trying to inspire people and comfort people and reason with people, they've been using fear. Well, they're also using just like shame, you know, uh, that, mm -hmm. that you're a bad citizen, you, you don't care about other people. And I think that, uh, uh, an administ you know, coming off of Trump, an administration like this, like they're they're uniquely positioned to be that sort of uh, scold uh, w with everybody, and I, I'm just I'm still amazed at how so many people are just falling into that. You watch the I saw some comments. Uh, there was like a, a news story posted to Facebook about you know an airline that was getting ready to fire people who aren't vaccinated, and I was like, oh, let's see what the comments are. And of course, the comments were. Uh, I think it was the Guardian. So, of course, you know, their readership is what it is. But it was like 90 percent like, hey, I I'm glad. Fire those guys. They don't deserve a job. They they should. Uh, I hope they die, you know. And uh, uh, so that that aspect of shame and people turning on one another is has been surprising to me. Yeah, it's not right. Ghoulish. I mean, it's like the compassion has gone out the window. I mean, and uh, it's it's been. For the all inclusive, I mean, for the message of inclusivity and uh, understanding and finding finding the middle ground between our differences, having it just discarded out of hand has been shocking to watch. It really has been. And uh, but it's it's it, you know, I mean, it seems as if you're I think you're right. I mean, there's there seems to be some orchestrated aspects to it. I mean, they've been trying for years to get the there, there was always these, you know, H1N1, bird flu, MERS, I mean, all these various uh, diseases that you would hear about, you know, they'd be somewhere in the far off, you know, in the far east, but they'd be presented like, oh, my God, here it comes. You know, it was, it was almost like there was a trope every couple of years. And it, and it was always it always felt there was a, this disconnect. Like, why are they fear mongering? And it, and it, it has this sense that like, oh, finally, they got one that go up and over and and, and take hold and, and, and get that that fear in place. And because I mean, traditionally, I mean, most of human society and history has been one of authoritarianism. I mean, there's always been some single force that was in control. And this experiment of having a, a free peoples and a free society is still very fresh and very unusual. And it takes and and uh, fear 
has always been the controlling mechanism and shaming and shunning and all these old world uh, uh, mechanisms that we almost kind of forgot existed in a way in these last like couple of decades. Um, you know, we, 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 we were living in, a, in an unusual time of peace and it was kind of, we, we, we got, uh, we got to experience what life was like without that. And it's been interesting to see like this has happened and it's sort of seen these old mechanisms get the, 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 the unfortunate squeaky wheel gets the grease and they started churning. And now we've all experienced what it is to walk down the street. If you're not wearing a mask and you start getting the, the, the eyes of shame. Um, and, and now we're at that sort of enough is enough period where people are making that claim on both sides. But, uh, but there was a, there was a push maybe two, three weeks ago where enough is enough. And, and like accusing children who are going to school without masks to be murderers, you know, and, and just like over the top language. It's, 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 we need to find our way back to civil discourse. Like the, the civil society is so important. And I think people are losing sight of that. And that's part of what we want to do is we got to find our way back to that, that civil discourse and that conversation to get, you know, the dynamo that is our, our culture, which is differences of opinion, you know, battling it out in, in the civil arena. That's what it's all about. You were able to get that by talking with Naomi Wolf and I, I don't expect you to uh, reveal any surprises or scoops or anything like that, but uh, can you talk about some of the other people uh, famous or, or, or not who, who uh, are going to be in, uh, on screen in this. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that we're, we're still in in the process of of making that happen. Uh, we we definitely have some people uh, already on board. Uh, one interview that we're going to be doing soon is uh, Dr. Peter McCullough, who has been a uh, a very active voice over the last year. Uh, Epidemi epidemiologist who's who's been um, very present in the mainstream media pushing back against this. We're aiming to get interviews with the great Barrington uh, doctors, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Koldorf, uh, uh, and Gunetra Supta. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. Um, and uh, uh, Hawk, you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're in talks with a few folks that we can't reveal at this time, but uh, but we've been um, we've been sort of talking to a lot of the the big voices. We had a nice interview with Dave Smith, for instance, and 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 those who are speaking well into this space, um, uh, and um, uh, Janine Yunus, who's that she's a, the lawyer who's been working hard for all the uh, all the various. Um, um, Professors like a professor at GMU and, and I, I believe a, an employee at uh, Michigan State who are, are claiming natural immunity and trying to push back against the jab, that kind of stuff. Um, but we're building it out. You know, we're, we're, we basically what we did was we decided to go into production, even though we're still in the development phase and, and building our catalog and uh, and just kind of demonstrating that we're really after a, a nice array of people, different voices, a variety of voices. Uh, we have a, a very strong character named Nick Hudson who's working with us. He's he's going to be uh, sort of our, our sort of generalist uh, a science communicator on the science front. I mean, we're speaking a little bit about science and, and specialists, and and I feel like we're almost entering an age of generalists because it's sort of like the specialists all go so far down into their space they no longer understand each other. And uh, Nick is a uh, he's a co-founder and the chairman of uh, the Pan Data. Pandata.org, which is a, um, a it's an organization. They have like thirty. Uh, they're represented in thirty countries, and he's he's based out of South Africa, and he's a very good science communicator. He can take the that 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 specialist understanding of science and bring it back down to a very uh, digestible way of understanding it. And that's what his organization is dedicated to. So we've been we've been collaborating closely with him. He'll be a major voice in this. So we, we're, we're we're happy to and proud to be working with him. Um, and it, and it grows from there. We're really, we're, we're, we're the, 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 you know, in the standard film parlance as our, as the film package grows and we get uh, stronger and stronger names with it, we're opening doors to more names. So we're, we're adding as we go. That's good. Is, uh, and again, you don't have to answer this, but is there uh, uh, one or two people who are kind of your, your dream thing, your, your dream guests to have in this, or, or we're talking about that jeopardize um, the chances of getting them? We've been pretty public about it, so I think we can. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, what we we're really hoping uh, that um, 
Mike Rowe will work with us. We think he'd be a great um, host in terms of like working with the, the human interest story aspect. Uh, we're, we're actually, you know, putting together a package for Cheryl Atkinson. We think she'd be a very good voice to help digest the sort of the narrative um, um uh, political the, the political media narrative going through it. Uh, the main idea was that we had we ha would have sort of a science communicator, a um, a a a human interest uh, grounded communicator host, and then a and a specialist in the uh, in the political uh, news media type specialist to help us digest that. So those three realms. So we have three main characters in the form of ideals right right now. It'd be like Nick Nick Hudson, Mike Rowe, Cheryl Atkinson, and so that we they would be in charge of maintaining those throughout the series, and they would kind of go on their journey of understanding. And come and, and sort of gather that knowledge, and and uh, and then ultimately in the, in the in the later episodes, they would then sit down and begin a conversation and sort of bring what they've learned through the the, the perspective of, of a host, but also from from their own expertise and and begin that conversation because we think developing that discourse is a big part of what we're going to do, and not just have people talking at you and then having you know having. Uh, uh, conclusions presented to you, but we want to have a conversation that leaves it open to the viewer to make decisions for themselves and learn learn with them. So we have them as sort of stewards of stories. So those are sort of those are sort of our three ideal uh, that our trifecta of hosts. We're we're very much on this sort of uh, triangulation uh, yeah. theme in terms of the structure of the show. I, I like that idea, of not having a um, you know there are documentaries or stories where you know you're trying to prove a very specific point and you do want to you know, sort of uh, in an honest but rigorous way, sort of push everyone to that. But but this is such a big issue. And, and as you said, I think that the kind of the, the number two issue behind, you know, the lost liberties is that exact thing, that dehumanization, the depersonalization of this. Um, and who knows if we can get a little bit of that back. But um, I think that's a great idea to, to, to push toward that rather than, you know, trying to, you know, convince 100 million people that they're they're wrong. Yeah. Uh, about everything. Getting people to admit they're wrong is one of the most difficult things you can ask of anyone. I mean, think about things that you've simple decisions you made in your own past that you know were wrong and, and, and you still have this amazing and we all have this amazing ability to sort of rationalize it away out in our own minds, in our own personal stories. But we really feel as if that we're trying to generate a story an understanding and a conversation that allows people to save face is is an alternative to this this divisive story that's that's taking hold of all of us this fear-based story and gives people an ability to walk you know to, to to metaphorically walk back to a an arena in which all voices are welcome again and uh you know we we are all i mean we believe profoundly in in the in the I don't know, call it sacred nature of self-expression. I mean, for some reason, humanity has the ability to perceive, think of something, and then and then hold that thought, and then and we can enunciate it and express it and express it to a lot of people. It happen, I mean, there's a reason that's part of our First Amendment, and I, I think trying to uh, rehabilitate the um, the um, holding sacred, the ability to express ourselves, even when it's something that we don't disagree with, and yeah. think about why. How does that reflect? Are, if that person's expressing something that makes no sense to me, how does it reflect my own views and, and getting into that debate? And we want to we want to reclaim that space, and that's what we hope to do with this series. Uh, to, add, uh, add to, that, uh, to add to that a bit, there, there's a phrase that Hawk likes to use, uh, which is uh, to awaken the inner dissident. And I, to my mind, uh, we will have been successful with this project if enough people question what they were told by the mainstream media and the politicians and hold in their mind this idea that maybe what we are being told uh, isn't correct and and then apply that to any any propaganda that they're fed from the media or the politicians in the future. To, to my mind, that's the most fundamental thing that we can do is is not convince people that lockdowns are wrong, not convince people that vaccine mandates aren't a good idea. Uh, you know, no, all of those are important, but the, the root level is to get people to not take as sacred what they're told by the media and the politicians. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, something that I've been uh, wondering about for a long time. I actually uh, used to be a newspaper reporter, went to grad school for journalism, 
And what I found pretty quickly was um, that the older professors and the older people in the profession were still had a little bit of that fire and wanting to, you know, go get a scalp as far as, you know, uh, uh, taking down a, a dirty politician or something like that. But, but people my age and younger, they don't seem to want to do that. They seem to be very, they enjoy the status and the power, uh, such as it is, if you make it to a certain level in that, is there anything else that explains why I would think that there would be like one reporter or one network or one newspaper who would say, man, some of this is fishy. And if we throw some resources at this, we can tell a different story. Uh, you know, you mentioned Hollywood having a culture, um, is it, I mean, you may not know the answer to this, but is it so bad that like every single journalist in a, a, a so-called mainstream uh, avenue is, they seem completely uninterested in, in doing anything but repeating the press releases on this? Well, you see the rare the rare journalists who, and they're leaving the, the mainstream publications. You think about people like Alex Berenson, Barry Weiss, um, they are having to separate from from these uh, conduits of of information in our culture because they're more interested in truth than towing the party line. And those are people that we're looking to connect with for this project for that very reason. Um, and also, uh, you know, although I wouldn't necessarily hold him up as somebody I agree with 100% of the time, Tucker Carlson seems to be walking that that line. Uh, even Bill Maher seems to be walking that line. So there are, there are people who are pushing against those edges and, and trying to step outside of the, the lines a bit. Well, I think Glenn Greenwald is a good example of somebody yeah. who's mm, like, yeah. he's, got, he's got a very interesting, robust set of views and some, some I've some are spot on. Some I'm like, I'm not quite sure why he thinks that way. But his journalistic integrity is unquestionable. That guy will look at everything, and he gives it an honest, honest view that you don't see anymore. And I, yeah. and I think to answer your question a bit, I think, I mean, we're we are at a meet. I mean, we're living through history in a lot of ways. We've had 15, 20 years of internet that we are affecting us psychologically in ways that we don't fully understand. Journalism, old world journalism, dead tree journalism is certainly a dying industry. Hollywood's a dying industry. We're, we're looking at a major, major shift. And I think the, the the desperation to maintain the few pennies that come in and the journalistic side has, has sent the journalistic integrity out the door. But now the new technology is sub stack. I mean, I think that's why right now we're all obsessed with like YouTube is shutting things down and other other platforms We're like okay well we thought the journalistic integrity is moving there but now the corporate corporations seem to be um putting up a roadblock but i i might i think we're looking at such a major transition in terms of where we're going to find truth where we're going to find integrity and how how it's going to be you know think it say it say it to a lot of people how you're going to say it to a lot of people is 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 constantly evolving i mean even podcasts is is, is is relatively new and it's and it's taking the world by storm because it's these these amazing conversations that are that are not just topical but held for posterity that anyone can access and they're the deep conversations that are fireside chats more than just these sound bites that we were been, been forced to listen to for the last 20 30 40 years on mainstream news yeah um I, in uh, just a few minutes i want to get into you know, how people can uh, track what you guys are doing, help what you guys are doing. Um, give us a, um, uh, well, let, let's ask this question first. And this is kind of the standard stock uh, dumb question about somebody who's working on a project like this, but sometimes it gets uh, a, an interesting answer. But like, what, um, have you found out anything that surprised you, uh, disheartened you, that opened up a whole new avenue of, you um, uh, of what you want to do with the film. Has anything sort of unlocked like that in the process of uh, starting to do this before you had it fully planned out? That's a good question. Um, I mean, a few weeks ago, I mean, my, my main answer would have been, is, is well, I mean, still is, is that uh, just learning how data is collected is so manipulated just from the get-go. I mean, just, you know, where until data has been reported to the state, that data doesn't exist. So so when, you know, if the state, if the if the local government, say, of California doesn't put, you know, send out for the data to be sent in by the hospitals, there wasn't, there, there isn't the daily uptick 
it's sort of they get that group number and suddenly like my god we had a huge up up increase this past week and that has nothing to do with the reality on the ground and that's just an example of how how each state, each county, each country has different ways of, of adjusting the data so they can really manipulate it in almost any way you can. And that's something we're going to be looking at. Just just decoding that is almost mind-numbingly difficult to pull off. I mean, and and, uh, and 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 yet that's where that's square one. When you know we talk about like these charts, I mean, just just trying to understand how the data is collected it can be so influential. Um, one of the things, though, is we when we started this project, we thought well, we want to do this because we want to make sure we capture this story, because who knows, maybe it'll blow over in two or three months, and it's important to capture this. And the fact that it's now we are really facing a truly, truly divisive uh, a culture divided. I mean, we're, we're it's turning into a culture war of sorts, um, or 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 threatening to become um, one of, of a of a worse nature and. Uh, I want to get. I just want to try and give everyone an ability to have someone they can relate to in this series, so that they can find their way through this quagmire of uh, of of fear. Um, it's really it's really important to have this be um, as fair to as many people as possible because everyone everyone has the right to be terrified because the all the normal sources are telling them to be terrified. Yeah, and we and we and we need to we need to give people a way out. I, I a couple of examples of. Uh... Uh, well, just one example of, you know, uh, kind of the media and the statistical data gathering thing. I saw a headline the other day. It said uh, it was, you know, you're supposed to be scared by this. It said one third of new COVID cases among the unvaccinated. And so, well, okay, where did the other two thirds come from? Right? <laughs> right, right. You know? yeah. yeah, what you lead with is everything, yeah, right? And, and, and like when I first saw it, I, I did, I was like, I was like, oh, that, and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> there's only two kinds of people that can come from. Uh, but the other thing, and I had this reaction like almost, um, uh, almost immediately, and my wife got tired of me bringing this up all the time. But like, are, are you telling me that every nurse at every hospital is recording these things the same way, is administering the test the same way, is, you know, re reporting the data to their, you, you know, like it just, it just boggles the mind that people think these statistics can be relied upon when uh, there's literally tens of thousands of people involved in collecting it and they're doing it on the fly. So, well, uh, and, and, and just out coming to understand the, the, the sheer complexity of our own immune system, it's as if it doesn't exist. It's, it's as if we're not humans that have, have you know, evolved this incredibly complex system called the human body. And the human immune system and it, and it's 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 sort of in gamified like if you walk into a room with someone who may have tested positive you know you've you've got your your the color of your dot in the model has changed and now you're now you're a threat to everyone else and that's just not how it works yeah. and i think trying to get back at to the wonder of the human body is a big part of what we want to accomplish as well yeah, yeah and i'd also say just the the wonder at at um the subtlety and nuance of life i i mean what one of the things that I, I don't know if you've come across this Spartacus letter. Um, uh, this this anonymous source published a, a, an in-depth examination of um, various aspects of of the COVID crisis, and he went into great depth. He or she, I don't know who it is, uh, um, about the mechanics of COVID and how it impacts the body. I couldn't. I, I understood maybe five percent of it, and in reading it, it just, it made me so aware that my knowledge of the human body is so superficial. Um, and that is one of the mechanisms that the media and politicians have used to influence people is taking advantage of the fact that most people don't understand nuance, nor do they want nuance. They want simple answers. Um, just having a, a reasonable discussion about the effectiveness of masks. Um, you know, I, I, re I remember seeing all of these memes on Facebook of people showing somebody uh, like peeing versus peeing in their underwear. And, and, you know, it, it's like, uh, duh, a mask works. Well, you know, that's a, that's a very unnuanced uh, analogy to what's going on with masks and with the way viruses work. Um, and and it, it, it's, 
I, I guess it's been a great disappointment to me to see how few people really have uh, an interest and desire to understand things at that nuance level, which is the truth. You know, nuance is the truth. Complexity is the truth of life. Yeah. Um, one uh, more little avenue to go down before uh, we start to wrap things up is uh, uh, this gave me the idea you're talking about this letter. If And you can each answer this. Um, if there was, uh, if you could get a whistleblower who would do one of those confidential, you know, 60 minutes interviews where they're, you know, completely obscured. If you could get a whistleblower from one organization, one aspect of this problem, uh, who would you uh, like to talk to? What type of person would you like to get in the interview chair? Interesting question. It's evolved. I mean, there's that aspect of I mean, what happened in Wuhan, which of, which of course is something we all want to know about in terms of the lab. And yet it's almost, we're, we're, and we're, we'll get into that, but we almost, we've been learning that that's, it's, it's, that's almost becoming less and less important because it, it's almost, I mean, I want to know like that insider in the government who saw those grants and knew the intent of what that research was. It's, it's, um, you know, I want to understand why was this happening? Why was this research on the table? Why was it connected to Fauci? Why was it, uh, is it Eco Health, whatever the, uh, the the network is that uh, um, applied for it, spread it out? Um, and th and then there's all these other organizations and corporations that are involved. There's it's just one of these things like why was that occurring? And then of course why was that? And then and then the fact that it was pushed aside. Well, clearly it has nothing to do with it. I mean that there's a there's a, there's definitely that's where everyone smells a lot of fishiness going on. But but what was the intent there? I think I think there are those in government who were very aware of of what that was all about, and we'll hear about that someday. And I would love to I would love to interview someone like that. John, what do you think? Uh, I, I, Hawks stole my thunder. I mean, I, I, I would have to agree that, that to me, that's fundamental to getting a handle on, on what's happened here is, is, um, where it started and who was in the know about it. And, um, maybe actually I, I would shift my answer a bit. It's related, but, um, I, I would like a whistleblower who was close to Fauci and, and who could talk about what, what his real agenda is and uh, what, he, what he says when he's, uh, you know, sitting alone in his office and, and planning for the next day. Yeah. Um, yeah, is it just megalomania? So that, that or would is be there... my answer. <laughs> no, is he, is he... I mean, I, I, the, the, the thing about that, like I, I was just talking to a, a family member of mine who's slowly waking up to all of this. Uh, you know, they, they were very um, bought into the, the whole vaccine paradigm. They bought into the, the necessity for the lockdowns and the masks. And I've been exposing them to information very slowly. And and they said to me, you know, I, it's just hard for me to believe, you know, Fauci is just such a, a warm, wonderful person. I can't imagine that that he'd be lying to us about any of this. Yeah, and and so, you know, uh, that that's that I, I would love to see that that facade ripped away in a, in a serious way. And, and, and to be clear, we're very pro science. We want to see the Institute of Science, the scientific method put back on the proper pedestal and use the way it's supposed to, the way it was promised to, to, to be. And, and we, we, that's part of what we're doing as curious storytellers. We want to, we want to try and support those scientists who know that the, the game has gotten corrupted and that the scientific method has been pushed aside. We feel that there's something, there's a lot of scientists we feel have a lot to say about that subject. Yeah. And it's critical you. for, sorry. No, go I, I, I was just going to say that it, it, it's and, and it's not just about the importance of science. It's about the importance of human life. You know, you, you were talking earlier about how people are being shamed about uh, choosing not to take the vaccine. And, uh, you know, there are there are certainly credible people who are making the claim 
that it's the prevalence of the vaccine that is causing the variants and uh, killing more and more people. So uh, having a real scientific understanding of all of that is critical to saving people's lives. If if we place an emphasis on, on shaming rather than understanding, then on one side or the other, we're killing people. And yeah. and that's that's devastating. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, go ahead and uh, we should probably uh, wrap it up. Um, I could talk for another hour, but uh, I don't know if uh, people would stand for that. And you, you guys have a documentary to make. Um, so tell us how um, uh, you're raising money. Tell people how they can help with that. Um, do you need help with anything else? Um, you know, how can people help? Um, um, stay in touch with this project and help make sure it happens. Yeah, uh, well, we're accepting all comers on all, on all three of those fronts. Um, I mean, we are raising funds. We, we're we've uh, we have a, a fundraising campaign. We, we're about to do. In, we're probably in the middle of it when this uh, podcast is released. But we're doing a big final thirty day push to trying to f- hit our first mark of three hundred thousand um, for phase one for the pilot, and uh, we're halfway there uh, currently. And um, and so we have a, a site called it's fundraiser.com. It's F U N D R A Z R.com uh, forward slash follow the science. Uh, that's our, that's our uh, fundraising page. Uh, we welcome uh, small and large donations alike. Uh, we've had a c- tremendous uh, success with that um, and, and have done very well with the podcast community and, and, and whatnot. Uh, at our, um, via that site, you can also find your way to our website, uh, soundmindcreative.com. And there we have a portal. We're Sound mind, sound mind creative group. Sound, sorry, sound mind creative group. <laughs> dot com, um, our, our lengthy name, but uh, uh, but there we have a portal. We're actually inviting people. We're looking for stories. We're looking for that human interest story where, where people suffering in terms of the health system, in terms of their loss of livelihood, loss of business. Um, you know, we, we've talked to people who have you know lost loved ones during the lockdown. Their loved ones got trapped in the in, into the the healthcare system. Um, you know, loss loss of quality of life. I mean, so much human suffering occurred in the name of the lockdowns, in the name of of, of keeping um, the public health um, uh, priority in the form of COVID. That we're, we're very interested to, to 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 capture those stories. Those stories are also going to be part of a larger uh, catalog of stories that are going to be put into a historical. Um, um, cat, uh, we're, we're, we're talking to a group that's going to archive this stuff. So we want to capture the the, the, the the first person real time stories of what they experienced because it's very important to capture this stuff. And then also uh, we are looking to expand the Sound Mind Creative Group. We uh, we we are um, you'll sign you'll see our Proton email uh, Sound Mind Creative Group at Proton uh, Proton, Proton Mail. Mail. It's, it's protonmail.com yep. and uh, we have a growing group of various Hollywood and and you know film professionals across the country who have been contacting us we've uh, we've started to build out our team people who feel there's an important there have a strong drive to help us on this we are crewing up and uh, building our team so we're also looking for that so uh, please donate share your story or come work with us all three anything to add John yeah, I would just say that um, you know we're we're kind of going out, have been going out for the last four or five months with hat in hand to try to get this project made. And um, like Tom Woods said about this project, these things don't make themselves. And um, you know, this isn't this isn't any kind of project. We consider this the fight of our lives, and uh, we're we're at a critical juncture. Um, in in the history of civilization, and uh, our documentary alone isn't going to change that, obviously. Um, but if if people don't start making content that challenges the the traditional narrative, that puts heterodox viewpoints out there, um, we're, we're going down a really bad path. And um, we we believe that what we're making is is going to create. A, a niche in that armor to help bring Goliath down. And um, so, you know, we we just ask that people join us in this fight um, it, to whatever level they can do it. Um, and and um, one thing we should mention is that the, at the $500 level, P- 
people become a part of our advisory community and can actually uh, help to give us feedback, help to shape the, the course of the project. So that's that's a level that we, we would love to, you know, welcome people into that community and kind of become a part of our exclusive circle to get this made. Sure, that, that's a, a good note to end on. I will have all the links to all of that um, on the show notes page and tell, uh, tell people a little more about it in the outro here. Um, uh, you guys have to promise, we'll say goodbye, but you have to promise to come back on when this is done and people can see it and we can have the cameras on and, and use your real names, okay? Absolutely. <laughs> all yeah, right. Looking forward to it. Sounds yeah. good. And there you have it. I'd like to thank Hawk and John for their time. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the finished product and hopefully having them back on uh, when we can see not only the finished product, but be able to see them and get to know them uh, a little better. Links to the page uh, where you can help them complete the project and to some of the stuff uh, that they mentioned. Uh, those are going to be over at the show notes page, decentralizedrevolution.com slash 64. Thanks to Dave versus Goliath for all the music you hear on Decentralized Revolution. And thanks to everyone who subscribes to our email list and gives to Mises Pack at TakeHumanAction.com. And everyone who shares, rates, reviews, and subscribes to Decentralized Revolution. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.